All right, I'm going to do my best to get through this and get a little ahead so we can kind of make up some of our time. But I get a lot of questions about painting technique at summer institutes uh, and from people when we get an opportunity to get together like this. It always leads into some sort of discussion with me trying to pull up pictures on my phone or on the internet. Hey, let's go over to this computer and look at this thing. So I'm going to try to sort of cover uh, you know, what I know about painting and share with you here in the next couple of minutes um, to the best I can. First of all, when you look at spray paints, please do everybody a favor and avoid Valspar like the plague because it doesn't completely solidify. We've gotten burned on Valspar too many times for it to be a coincidence of one batch of paint. So Valspar may have value for giving fresh life to some of your tired wicker furniture for the summer season or something, but it's not for a guitar, okay? Uh, you're going to get what you pay for, and you want to choose something that's, that's good quality. It's a, not, it's a good idea to stick to the same brand or family of paints when possible. And the thing that I certainly recommend towards people for the primer and the color, most certainly, is the Duplicolor Perfect Match. They're short cans of spray paint, and they're on the pricey side. They're going to get 8 or $9 for a can of that. And you can expect to use one or one and a half cans of each thing for the guitar. So it's smart to just go ahead and bite the bullet and buy two cans of paint, save the receipt. I fold it up in a little tiny square, and I stuff it up in the cap so I don't lose it. And then if I end up with one that I don't use, I can take and get my money back. But invariably, you know, if you only buy one, then, oh, darn, I need some more, and then you don't have it. And then, heaven help you, if you get a batch that's a different lot number, and maybe the color isn't quite the same. So the metal flake looks awesome. People should definitely practice before they use it, because spraying metal flake poses an additional technique challenge of ma a mastery level deal as far as getting the metal flake to lay consistently, evenly flat, and be uniform in its appearance. Um, it's not the same as spraying a color of paint with no metal flake in it. And definitely practice, practice, practice on all this stuff. Uh, good cans of paint are going to have a fan pattern, much like a spray gun. And the Duke color has <laughs> that, so the other better cans do also. There's a little plastic insert piece on the nozzle that you can rotate to change it to a horizontal or vertical fan line rather than a circular spray pattern. You can paint with a circular spray pattern, but when you can make that, when you can make that flat line come out of the can, that's nice. Um, typically, you need a spray gun uh, to paint material lay properly. You can get by with spray cans, but if you've got a compressor and you've got some sort of gun, um, that's nice. If it says that you don't need to fit it, you end up still in just a teensy, teensy bit, okay, to improve the flow. If you go overboard, it'll sag and run in a hurry, and it won't, it won't Play like it's supposed to. Uh, getting back to the spray paint, the spray paint can and the cap and the, and the nozzle deal that rotates. Um, you know, you're gonna, you can make it do a vertical pattern, and that's typically for left and right, and you can make it do a horizontal pattern for. Oh, this is the, this is the, the spray gun. I got it in myself. I apologize. If you take the metal tabs on the spray gun, such that, like in the photograph, the tabs are oriented horizontally, you will get a vertical pattern result. It's 90 degrees rotated. And if the cap, like on the right, were rotated so that the metal pieces were in a vertical line up and down, that would make a horizontal spray pattern. Horizontal spray pattern is for spraying up and down. Vertical spray pattern is going left to right. Distance from the surface of the spray gun is ideally somewhere around 12 to 14 inches. If you lower the pressure or you've got a different kind of viscosity, you may end up getting a little bit closer. But I find I use a spray gun and I spray bone anovia. And it's an off-label application, as they would say in the medical community. Right? It's not, I don't think it's ever meant to be sprayed, but I've had very good results spraying it in its physical properties, uh, just, just from five senses observation, well, not all five senses, but a couple of the senses observation. Um, it is darn near similar, same kind of stuff as what they tout as a water-based lacquer. In its color, viscosity, odor, uh, visual appearance, on and on and on. It, it just, it seems, it's, it's it must be what? Yeah. Bonanovia. Yeah. I imagine you could probably do Bona Mega like we now use at some of the summer workshops. I just haven't tried it. It's I just haven't just tried it. Bona, B-O-N-A, N-O-V-I-A. Or N-O-V. Yeah. And so I get that from floormechanics.com in West Virginia. Or Amazon. Okay. Um, when you spray, I have a little representation of like a board here. You want to get the fan pattern perpendicular to your motion of travel. And you want to overlap your fan pattern a little bit so that the overlapping paths, everything has a chance to kind of flow and melt together. 
spray off the sides of your project. So in other words, when you, you're going to start and stop off the sides of the project because initially, when you pull the trigger, when you let go, there can be an irregular flow of paint, larger size droplets and so forth, and a spatter that you would, would mess up your paint job. So in this instance, I might go left to right, across the top, drop down a little bit, right to left, drop down a little bit, and back and forth. And I try to encourage the students, pretend you're a robot. Okay, the more mechanical that you can pretend to be about this, the better chances you're going to get a good result. On multiple coats, it's not a bad idea to change your direction pattern 90 degrees. So if you sprayed one coat on left to right, do another one up and down. And when you move over to go from one path, spray path to the next, the, the step over, how much you move, like the left to right, you drop down, and left to right, drop down. You're not dropping down very much because you want to get some overlap. You want to paint the hard to reach areas first, and, and there's a YouTube video on the STEM guitar channel that talks about this. Try to paint all the hard to reach places first, around the neck pocket and, and the horn area. That's the hardest to reach places first. Paint the perimeter of the body. In so doing, you're going to get overspray up on the front and the back of the guitar, and you're going to end up painting some of the front and the back before you, by collateral damage, before you ever intentionally paint the front and the back of the guitar. If you go the other way and you save the hard to reach areas last, in trying to spray them, you're going to get overspray on places that have already painted, and you increase the chances of having a run or some other uh, imperfection in paint finish pop up. So some common problems in paint technique is zigzags. Okay, if we're going to do left to right, you're going to see this all the time. First one, first pass across is great, they drop down a little bit, and boom, they go down on an angle instead of staying parallel with their first pass. And it's back and forth, and you have places that maybe the paint application is appropriate, and then it, there are thin places as the two paths get wider. Uh, another problem you have is people just, they move, they drop down too much. They do that first pass and then they drop down a whole bunch and they go up and it's wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. You want a consistently wet application of paint when you first spray it on. Um, if you overlap too much, then you just have too much accumulation of paint and it runs. Just like if you go too slowly and you, you pull the trigger and you're running across and you go too slowly and the paint's just blasting on the surface and it'll, you know, gravity is just going to have its way with the whole deal. Um, other common problems, if you go back and say, oh, there's a little spot that's kind of thin, I just want to, I just want to touch that up. Uh, yeah, you get that nice and wet, but you've got overspray all around that results in the, the area surrounding it all dull and hazy and dusty. Again, that's why you paint the hard to reach places first and then do the easy stuff, as you, and progressively the easiest stuff is always last. Practice, 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 practice. I'll have kids take pieces of masonite, put some sealer on it, prime it, Painted a color, paint over top of it, I'll have pieces of maple, because maple is really hard and dense, it takes paint very well, and I'll have them practice on blocks of maple with all the aspects of the painting and the buffing and wet, wet sanding that we'll talk about next before they do their guitar. Uh, if you put too much paint on it, it'll make a run. If you get too little, it'll be dusty and dull, and, and it'll, you can actually, like, it'll dry really fast. It like, dries in midair, and then it sits on the guitar, and you can actually take your finger on it, and it just, it's, there's pigment on your finger. Um, the paint should look wet and shiny as it goes on the guitar. Do not touch the surfaces before or after painting because there is, even if you go and wash your hands and you come over, there is oils, naturally occurring oils in your skin that will transfer to your paint surface and can mess up your paint job and keep your paint from adhering. And every year we paint guitars, somebody's first attempt at a paint job has got fingerprints in the paint. Even though I swear I didn't touch it after I painted it. Yeah, but you touched it before you painted it, didn't you? And I can tell. You touched it here, 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 and here. So we've got a guitar at school that's got a thumbprint and, and a couple of index finger spots from, from where they touched it and handled it. Um, when you go out with a tack cloth to remove any dust that has settled under the surface before you paint it, go easy with it. I've seen students rub with a tack rag so hard that they transfer the adhesive off of the tack rag. If you don't know a tack rag, it's like a cheesecloth, like a gauze bandage, and it's sticky. Um, and so you can actually transfer the adhesive off of the, the, the pad onto the surface you're going to paint. And then that causes all kinds of wrinkling and stuff with the paint that's just a mess. Allow the paint to fully dry. Students think after 20 or 30 minutes, hey, it's ready to dry. The student literally 20, 30, 20 minutes after, 15 minutes after you paint it. Check this out, man. My guitar looks great except it's done on the table. It's skinned over on the surface, but it's not hardened all the way through. And it takes overnight for all that all that to gas out, especially after the surfaces have got the skin on it. It's got to permeate through that. Something to keep in mind, too. The paint looks like it's solid. It really isn't. Stuff can permeate out from underneath and leach out from underneath later. And stuff can also get on it and 
travel through clear coating and color coating. So you don't want to let it get overnight. Uh, I think this is the last slide on this, and I'll switch to the buffing and the polishing. I know I'm going really fast. Uh, you want to get it sealed. You've got raw wood, and you've got to figure out some way to seal it. You can use Death Lacquer Sanding Sealer. That one looks awesome. Stinks terrible. Works great. Dries fast. Sands easy with a high solid content. Um, if you get waxless shellac, and you have to be really careful to make sure that, you're not, that you are getting the, the waxless shellac, because there are, shellac in nature is it's a finish that's, that's suspended in alcohol, and it is collected from the resinous secretions of insects like in India. And the, the naturally occurring waxes that are in it get all over the furniture, and if you're just doing shellac, it's not a problem. But if you want to put other paints on top of it, some paints don't stick well, chiefly the ones we want to paint guitars with, usually. So they do have a waxless shellac, and that's the thing to buy, and you can thin that down about 50-50. The coats dry really fast because it's a lot of alcohol and it flashes off. You'll get an initial grain raise, and it's all fuzzy. You sand it smooth with some fine sandpaper, and you want to build up several coats. And I tell students, you, what, however you seal it, it shouldn't feel like wood before you're ready to go to paint. It should feel kind of like plastic before you go into paint. Bonus seal is great too. We're using that right now. Um, sand the seal it flat and reapply it until, as needed until it's plastic film. Then you're going to primer it. I love the Duplicolor filler primer. It's not going to take care of a big gouge, but if you've got subtle scratches from sanding it and so forth, it will fill a lot of that stuff in with a super high solids content. It's really easy to sand. You prime it that first time, and you'll sometimes see imperfections you didn't recognize early on because the grain obscured your vision of, of seeing the real surface. It's easy to go back and you touch up spot prime places after you've sanded and fixed things. Um, and then you're going to put on a color coat. Don't sand it. That might be a couple coats of color, maybe, you know, whatever. And then the clear, if you use a duplicate color, you're going to need you know, at least two cans. Otherwise, you're going to do the bona. Uh, we, I've experimented a little bit with a polyester resin for surfboards that stinks terrible and makes me want to vomit, so I won't use it anymore. Uh, and I'm really eager to try the can of the two-part spray can material. i got three minutes on this one. I heard that. Thanks. Wait two weeks before you try to wet and buff sand. Uh, wet, uh, wet sand and buff out. I have completely finished out a guitar, spraying multiple coats of Bona, and wet sanded it and buffed it out 24 hours later to get it put together and get it done. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Um, if you're spraying Bona, it's thin light passes. You don't want to spray it on so it looks like it's wet. You want to look, spray it on so it looks like it's beaded up, like in the Thompson's water seal commercial. It's amazing how all those little droplets flatten out and level out and all kind of flow together. Just let it sit for 20 minutes. It won't, it won't look the same. You think the spray thing, I, didn't, I only painted about half as much as I need to. Eh, let it go. It'll all flatten out. And it, when you do that clear finish, you need somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 coats of clear finish to build up enough thickness to be able to withstand wet sanding and buffing, which is what we're going to talk about next. Once you have it sprayed with clear coat, you've built up an adequate thickness of clear coat, it's going to have an orange peel kind of look to it. And it's going to have a, a, an orange peel look to it. And in other words, what, and this happens anytime you spray anything. It doesn't matter if it's a spray can, if it's a spray gun, if it's water-based, if it's oil-based, if it's lacquer. The, the nature of the atomized droplets splashing against the surface, knocking into wet material that's already on the surface and so forth, it's going to have a certain amount of texture to it, uh, a lot like the skin on an orange peel. That needs to get sanded back, but you don't want to sand any more often than you have to. And then, at that point, it's going to be all hazy and scratched up and kind of ruined looking. And then it's a matter of going with a sweater, fundamentally, super fine, uh, super fine abrasives to bring back the shine. And, and the scratches get progressively smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until your eye can't really perceive them. So, to get started on this process, soak the sandpaper in a red solo cup with some wine. Have some fun with the red solo cup when you get there to this stage. But, uh, white styrofoam cups are too easy to puncture a hole in and it leaks out overnight and you come back in the morning. But the, the paper needs to soften, the paper backing needs to soften up overnight. And if you, if you have a cup of soapy water and you take a dry piece of sandpaper, plunk it in there and start wet sanding, you will put crazy, ridiculous scratches in your finish that you're going to be so mad about. I don't understand exactly what happens when you soak the sandpaper overnight in the water, but it fixes the issue. And that's something I got off the Stumac website after I ruined my, what I felt like I ruined my first attempt at doing a guitar job. Um, try not to put the paper in so much that it all sticks together. The water's got to be able to get the whole size of the sheet of paper. And sometimes the kids will have a little stack of paper and they throw it in. And the paper actually hugs together 
uh, and the water can't really fully get in between all the sheets like it used to. So you got to make sure that each each piece gets coated, gets access to the water on both sides. <clears throat> I try not to do anything with just my bare fingers in the sandpaper. I try to always have it, especially on the flat surfaces. You want to have some kind of block. Um, there are a variety of foam sand, sand blocks available, like at O'Reilly's and Auto Parts Store for auto body work. The thing that I find works really well is I got like a really inexpensive green foam kneeling pad for gardening work. It's about that thick. I like it if it was a little thinner, but it's about that thick. And I cut that up into cubes. Wrap a piece of the wet sandpaper around that, and then give, it has just the right amount of give for going over contours without being too hard. But it's not the same thing as sand. If you sand with your fingers, the raw wood stage, any of the paint stages, you're going to have a guitar that the flat surfaces are wavy and ripply. So the, the, the more you can do with a block at all the stages of sanding, especially on the front and the back of the guitar, the better off you're going to be. Um, sand in little circles. Sand in little circles. The overlapping circles are going to kind of crisscross the scratches that, that have to make in the paint. And as you get started, um, what you're going to see initially is that the guitar starts to get hazy looking. And if you get the light to bounce off, I'm all about and all, whatever you're doing, running stuff through the thickness sander and the planer or different aspects of paint, whatever your surface is, get the light to glare off of it so you can really understand and see what the, is happening with the surface of the light going off. When you get the light to glare off the surface here when you first start, the first, at, the first phase of this, it's going to be dull, but there's going to be these silvery speckly things when the light bounces off of it. Those are the low spots. You think about orange peel. Those are the low spots that the sandpaper hasn't touched yet. You've got to continue to sand the dull, hazy places that are the high spots. You've got to continue to sand those down until you get to the low spots. And everything needs to be uniformly dull. And the trick with that, the, here it is right here. And the trick with that is not to cut through the, thin, the clear finish and cut through the color coat and have primer or raw wood peek through. And that happens commonly on the edges. But this is a guitar where the wet sanding has begun and is probably about a third of the way there. Probably a third of the way there. I wouldn't even say that it's halfway there. It's probably a third of the way there. And here's one with a kid's body from this semester with sealer that they're sanding and they want to, they're thinking about putting spray primer on. It's like, nope, you've got some more sanding to do before you before you get into the spraying primer on there. You've got to take care of that. Um, be careful about the water. You've got soapy water. You, you deposit a little bit of soapy water on the, on the guitar. You're going to have some rags nearby. You want the paper. You don't want anything dry. And you go in little circles, and you kind of wipe it back and look. And then you deposit a little more water some, in the same spot or someplace else, and you do some more sanding. And you work in spots about like that big, in little circles. I love it. It's peaceful and it's quiet after all the messy, noisy <laughs> things. I love wet sanding and polishing, and I love doing the guitar setup because they're peaceful, quiet things that when you're all done with it, takes it from looking like, eh. So, oh, yeah, now we got something. And so that's, that, those are why those are my favorite kinds of things. You know. But if the water gets too much in the holes for some of the hardware mounts, it'll swell up, make a crater to try to wet sand it. And because it's raised up, you're going to take all the paint and all the clear finish and the primer off and everything, and you're going to have some raw wood show up. So you need to be unhappy about that. And if it swells up and the hardware doesn't cover it, you're gonna have, it's not going to be nice and flat and level when it's all done. Be careful at the edges, because this is where people want to go. And they'll take, if this is magnified, you know, they've got the sandpaper, and they'll run off the corner. And next thing you know, that edge right there, where it transitions from flat to the very top of the radius, clear finish gone, paint gone, primer shows, raw wood shows. And that's why it's important to inspect, too. The kids get to talking. Oh, yeah, the game last night, that was awesome in the third quarter. And it's like, do you even know what's going on? And then they wipe the stuff off. And it's like, when you wipe the paper towel, you got the paper towels in their eyes, you don't want to see any color in your rag. As long as it's wet, that's good. If you say you like a milky white, that's good. That's a clear finish. But if you see that your color pigment in your rag, it means you cut through the clear finish. Stop. We've got to spray some more clear color on it and give it some time to harden up. Okay? So it's important to monitor. Uh, and you're going to repeat the process with finer paper. I'll do 1,000. I'll do 50. Sometimes I'll do 1,500. Sometimes I'll skip it. It depends on my mood. It depends on what I think it looks like. I wonder if the same paper varies from lot to lot. Uh, and I also wonder sometimes if the, the material varies, you know. Um, I might go to 2,000 grit paper. I usually don't wet sand with 2,000 grit paper, but I might if I felt like I, there was a need for it. But I definitely do 1,000, and it's hit or miss 50-50 whether I do 15. I always put 1,500 in the cup. It's a little bit different color than 1,000, so I can tell the difference by color. But I, I always put them in the cup, and I don't always use it. And realistically, 
when, if you cut the pieces of paper in like two and a half inch squares, you should be able to do a guitar body with like three or four squares of sandpaper. It shouldn't take endless amounts of sandpaper. It only takes a little bit of sandpaper when sand the guitar body. And, you know, not, not any more than that either for a neck. If you wet sand, but if you spray the back of the neck and the front of the headstock, and you wet sand that and polish that out. So with the wet sand, uh, here, and here's some wet sanding on a neck on the front of the headstock for the student. Again, be careful about watering the holes. And you get a little more hardware and clamping force when you put the hardware together for the tuners. And a lot of times, because the holes are bigger, some finish gets inside the holes too. And so it, it's not too much of a concern about getting it in the big holes. The four bolt holes in the back you want to kind of avoid. Because the way we do it, the bolt, the neck is actually bolted to a, a scrap stick of wood that they can hang on to. So there's a spot on the back of the neck that doesn't have any finish on at all because it's just going to be concealed anyway. It gets put into the, into the pocket. Once you have all the wet sanding, you, you deem it finished. You don't see any more speckly, textured, bumpy places in orange peel when you get the light guitar. It's all uniformly dull and sufficiently ruined at this point. It's not shiny anymore. It's good. Then it's a matter of bringing the shine back. And I, these are my go-tos. These are my go-tos. Um, I use McGuire's mirror glaze. Uh, they got a fine cut cleaner number two. And then there's a mirror glaze number nine. And I love it because they have a whole product line with a yellow thermometer with a red line that indicates how much abrasive is, is, is suspended in the liquid. And when you use this, you get some old t-shirts. Get the kids to bring in some old shirts. You can't use anything with ink on it. The softer the shirt, the better. But old t-shirts, cut the back part, you know, back part of the bottom, waist area doesn't have any ink on it. Little squares, you know, about the size of index cards, a little smaller. You apply a dot about the size of a nickel onto the rag, and you need to feel some heat. You need to feel some warmth generated. That's that friction that's where the polish is actually cutting in and doing its job. And again, you got to monitor because if you get aggressive on the edges, you can you can polish right through and have primer showing. So it's abrasive. Um, and you're going to do that. You have a second clean rag, and you're going to buff it out. Again, you want to feel some warmth. And you want to feel some heat under your hand. After uh, after five to ten minutes, I don't know, after you do some, some polishing, your clean rag really gets to be about as gunked up as your polish application rag. So I just kind of switch them out. I take the application rag and I toss it, and my old polishing rag, buffing rag, becomes my new application, and I get, I get another piece that's clean. So I've always got one that's fairly clean, and I've got one that's, if, if it gets too wet, you know, too saturated, you're like, yeah, it's just another one that's like, start over again. Make sure that they don't have any kind of grit, dust, anything that you, because if you're going to rub it hard enough to make some heat, if there's any kind of grit in there of any sort, a piece of sawdust or anything, it'll, it'll scratch and leave a mark. There's nothing worse than bearing down on it to polish it and things have been going well. All of a sudden you look and you've got swirl groove in your thing because some piece of grit just got collected up in your rag. So I'm always shaking the rags out, kind of, you know, knocking it against my hand to make sure that there's not any foreign objects in there that are going to scratch and things. But these are my two, these are my two favorites. A lot of times you get away with stopping after the number two if it's a good paint job and a good white sanding job. The number nine just takes it up to the point where you can read the print off the light bulbs. You know? And these these two things in this process, I look at store bought guitars and I see what companies cut corners because instead of, they avoid the handwork. They think that they're gonna be able to take this straight off the spring, they let it cure, harden for a week or two, whatever it needs, over to the buffing wheels. And they got a coarser compound on it. Well, the buffing wheels can't reach everything. And they go and they take it to the final one, and they call it done. And not knocking anybody, but Gibson guitars in particular, because they glue the neck and the body together before they ever paint anything, the buffing wheels never get up alongside here. And you'll see lots of Gibson guitars with orange peel right up against the side of the neck where it's glued in like on the last ball because the buffing wheel could reach it. They don't want to buff the frets. When you buff metal, and the wheels turn black, it gets little bits of metal into the thing, and then now you're scratching up the rest of your guitar with that gray buffing wheel. So there's no substitute or shortcut for doing the hand well. I have a big buffing unit, and sometimes I'll use that to start. And it's, I start to see some progress, and it's like, okay, I don't feel good about trying to do any more of this with the buffing wheel. And I do the rest of it. I end up doing the whole guitar body by hand, anyhow. And that's it. So I don't know how we're doing on time. I know that, that went pretty quick. You're more than welcome to these PowerPoints. I know Tom's going to distribute them to everybody and make them available on Dropbox. Yep. But this is some pictures of products as far as some idea what to purchase. Um, and just kind of an overview. There's a ton of YouTube videos on the internet and there's stuff in books about how you do this kind of thing. Um, I learned, that's how I learned was one of these books. There's a guy who was a Mel, oh, such an unfortunate last name. He's a British author. Melvin? Who wants to go through like name Melvin? 
His name is Melvin, and his last name is spelled H I S C O C K. <laughs> Who's what? So, anyhow, uh, yeah, he wrote this book, and that was like my primer when I started building my first electric guitar. It was all hand tools. It was bandsaw and chisels and hand saws and drill press and all that kind of stuff, and that was what I started with. And uh, there was a section on polishing and wet sanding and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, this is kind of an outgrowth from what I learned from, from that part of the book, as well as information on the line about how to polish and wet sanding. I've got a couple of videos on the stem guitar channel now about the wet sanding and the polishing, too. So, I don't know where we are with time here. Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes again. Done yes, real quick. Um, yes. I'd also say that that product's awesome and it's silicone free. Number um, one or two? Uh, or both. Both of them. All, yeah. all of the Meguiars in, in that line yeah. are silicone free, which is important if you're going to do any sort of work afterwards with touch up or. Yeah, anything. any kind of repair work or anything, silicone won't stick, won't let it stick. <laughs> and silicone stuff is like uh, black plate with guitar finishes. Yeah, definitely. So, thank you for your time.